Hello, hello. And whenever I use, I need to use that on Thursday. People got quiet without using the gavel, right? Pretty. Um, ready? Everyone ready? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you so much for being here at a relatively short notice. Uh, what the heck? It's very short notice. Uh, sorry, sorry. So today, uh, we're going to announce what we think is a long overdue, very significant neighborhood initiative. Um, I, I represent a district in the city council of Philadelphia as other members where there are significant levels of opportunity and activity. Uh, but the reality is that in the majority and larger parts of the city of Philadelphia, there's areas that still have challenges and areas where the income inequality issue continues to thrive and expand. Uh, the reality is that uh, it is the ultimate responsibility for government to be supportive and initiate policies that support those individuals that tend not to be in upper income um, salaries, therefore not be in a position to take advantage of some of the very aggressive initiatives around the hub of Center City and a couple of our universities. So today uh, we have here a, a group of individuals that most people hold, if not all, in very high esteem that are prepared to discuss and talk to you about their support for this very important initiative uh, of course, uh, as always, the city council uh, is a team, and the team of council members here today uh, include Bobby Heenan, Mark Squilla, Kenyatta Johnson, Cindy Bass, Janie Blackwell, and I hope I'm not missing anybody else. And oh, I'm sorry, and my, <laughs> my, my majority leader, right? All right. Hey, you see that look he gave me. Um, and these are members who actually. Um, as you will see in the presentation, actually represent uh, areas that have these what we call opportunity zones. So basically, we have a proposal that is a, will have $681 million estimated in economic impact to the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we will be in a position, when implemented, to build in a period of two to three years uh, more than 15 hundreds of housing, 15 units of housing, uh, 1,000 uh, rental housing, and a thousand home ownership housing. Uh, we believe the, these particular units will um, be provided for that group of people who continue to have difficulty finding affordable quality housing. Uh, the simple reality is, is that there at one point in time were so many people on the waiting list for affordable housing for the Philadelphia Housing Authority, upwards of 10,000, they had to actually shut down the application process. Every time there's an affordable housing unit built by one of these developers, um, be it nonprofit or for-profit, uh, there's a line around the corner for people to try to be in a position to take advantage of that. And we have to come up with a strategy that allows us to leverage significant revenues, which you'll hear in the presentation, and accelerate the need and the willingness for us to be in a position to have additional housing. Today, uh, you will hear from representatives, and then we'll get into questions and get into some more specifics of the plan. Um, after I speak, you will have Ryan Boyer uh, from the Labor District Council. Uh, you will have Johnny Doherty from IBEW. We will have uh, Ann Fuldolan, who is the president of the Building uh, BIA, Building uh, Association. You will have uh, Raheem Islam who is from Universal Communities, and we will have Rose Gray uh, from APM, who is also uh, the president of the PACDC. Uh, so we would like to start right now with Mr. Ryan Boyer. First, I would like to thank the president of the city council and the fellow members of council for taking on a great issue. I'm Ryan Boyer. I represent 6,500 members in the Delaware Valley, 5,000 of whom live, work, and play in Philadelphia. And this issue is a serious issue, one of affordable, decent housing. This is how we rebuild communities. And this initiative is great because not only the houses, 
when you start building houses, you have to build businesses to sustain the people that are in those neighborhoods. So it's the start of a vibrant community. And we at the Philadelphia Building Trades and at the Labor's District Council of Philadelphia and vicinity want to partner with you in any way we can to bring this to fruition and to make sure it's a resounding success. I interrupted all my St. Patrick's Day you know, opportunities today to be here because this is a bold initiative. You know, and also I'm representing Pat Gillespie, who's a little bit under the weather here, and he has been part of the early process and wants to go on record as saying whatever the Philadelphia Building Trades have to do to make this bold initiative come to reality, you know, he will be involved at, at, in any way that he can. And I just want to thank Council President Clark and the council members because this isn't just creating houses. This is creating jobs. It's also creating neighborhoods. And we've seen this once before, okay, early on when we did the uh, revitalization of uh, the neighborhood in early uh, the early 2000s, that you not only create houses, but you start to put shop rights and Wawa's and banks and Starbucks and Apple stores and all the other entities that go with neighborhoods. You know, so this is something serious. This is something that whatever the Philadelphia Building Trades, the IBW, and all of our friends, you know, we're going to put our heart and soul behind this because we, we see the vision that the council president has. So thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Fadoon. I'm president of the Building Industry Association. I, too, would like to congratulate uh, Council President Daryl Clark and the City Council for taking on this very, very important issue. The members of the Building Industry Association build housing in the communities. We build affordable and market rate housing. I think um, the need for affordable housing in this city is well documented. A lot of the traditional resources that we've all looked towards as being able to finance that type of housing have been drying up, particularly the government resources, and this needed some bold and creative thinking. So we are thrilled to be here today and stand ready to support this in any way that we can. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rose Gray, and I'm the president of the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations. Our membership goes where no one else wanders. Uh, the for-profit, uh, the nonprofit industry uh, goes into areas that are very poor. We try to create mixed income communities and use, by using the tax credits to bring affordable housing. 9% credits without getting technical are very scarce in the state of Pennsylvania. The 4% leveraged with all the other funding that's going to be discussed today provides that opportunity for us to triple the production in Philadelphia so we can create a strong mixed income community that doesn't leave anybody outside. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rahim Islam. I'm president and CEO of Universal Companies. And uh, we do uh, a lot of affordable housing. We also do a lot of education. Um, and this is absolutely fundamentally sound uh, uh, public policy. Uh, we see in, in today in Philadelphia and many of our cities two different cities. Uh, we see a prosperous, uh, aggressive uh, uh, wealth. And then we see neighborhoods where we see predominantly dominated by African Americans and Latinos where you see absolute poverty. It just makes great business sense for what you're doing. And it's about time. And we support this 1,000%, and we're behind you 1,000%. Thank you, Rahim. Uh, what, what I'd like to do is uh, ask Herb Wetzel, who's our uh, executive director of pretty much everything we need done around here, uh, other than lawyering. We don't want her to deal with that because he doesn't have a lawyer's license. I uh, asked Herb to quickly go through the financing structure and just kind of walk us through this, the specifics of uh, this particular initiative, and then we'll, we'll very briefly get to questions. Uh, thank you, Council President. We actually have a board over here, but I can... Um, the Council President challenged us to, to really investigate the potential resources that could be used to develop affordable housing. And the two items that, are, that came uh, to us and through our research was essentially two things. One is there's a 9% low-income housing tax credit, and that's oversubscribed. We have way more projects that seek that credit than, than actually get that. 
However, the state of Pennsylvania also receives an allocation of what's called volume cap that allows them to do 4% low income housing tax credits. In any given year, we may leave on the table 500 million in volume cap in the state of Pennsylvania. Volume cap allows you to issue tax exempt bond financing, but also if you're doing an affordable rental housing project, it allows you to essentially sell a 4% credit. So the model here is that we will, instead of this gap being filled by CDBG funds or other funds, the project will sell the equity, and this is a rough estimate of about $100,000, and then the project will issue tax-exempt bonds for a $200,000 mortgage, getting to the ability to build the units on an average cost of about $300,000 which is the normal cost of a 9% credit right now. Where this bond issue comes in is you have income of tenant rent, and then there are PHA operating subsidies called ACCs that are available to, uh, to developments like this. So the ACC kicks in about $9,600, and you have about $12,600 in income, but you've got to pay that mortgage off. And that results in a $4,360 operating loss. If we, we, we issue the bonds and then we take $100,000 for each unit of the bond proceeds, put that in a trust account, and pay this $4,360 per year for the next 30 years, we've made possible the development of low-income housing tax credit at 4%. It's a different model, and it uses two untapped resources operating subsidies from PHA, and the 4% low-income housing tax credit. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, we want to thank uh, eConsult Solutions, who helped us work through the economic impact of, of building 1,500 affordable units. Um, and there's more detail in the, in the booklet, but essentially the overall economic impact will be 681 million, approximately 4,248 jobs created and supported through the construction spending of about 416 million in labor income and adding another 518 million to the gross domestic product of Philadelphia. At the same time, nearly 27 million in tax revenue will be generated from wage taxes, sales tax, transfer tax um, on, on the properties and income from real estate taxes as the, pro as the properties come online. On a permanent basis, there'll be about 118 permanent jobs created because the rental projects require managers and maintenance people and others to work in them with an ongoing impact of about 11.5 million per year, about 5.2 million in labor income and another 9.6 million to the gross domestic product for Philadelphia. And in the end, this will add about 137 million in property tax value added to the property tax base. Thank you, Mr. Wetzel. Okay. Any questions? Just, this, this gentleman, actually, he's just, I know. Well, it's interesting. Traditionally, uh, the traditional community development block grant dollars that come from the federal government set parameters around 60% of median income and 80% of median income. Um, in this particular home ownership initiative, we've actually gone higher than the norm because we understand that there's this category of people, and we like to actually call this workforce housing, that work, um, have decent jobs, the, the, the nurse, that happens to be a man, and the police officer who happens to be a woman. Um, there's no real housing being built for those individuals. And one of the things we want to do in, certain, in some of these neighborhoods is new construction. Uh, so that those particular people can afford the quote unquote 10 year tax abatement that other people experience in some of these other neighborhoods where you're being four or five or 600,000 housing. So that gives us the ability to go up to 120% median income is the way above the traditional Community Development Block and Dollars. And, sorry, Mr. Dunn. So is that gap financing model for both the rentals and the uh, purchases? Now, that's only for the, uh, 
Uh, the question is, is that model for both the home ownership and the rental? And the answer, that's rental only. The home ownership does not require a subsidy. Right. Yeah, that's in, in the details of that are in the, in the booklet, and I can get the answer for you. That, that What we had is eConsult run the economic impact numbers on this. Right. Is that number separate from the other? Yeah, my answer is I don't know, but I, I'll get the answer for you. Um, thank you. Currently, there's a process that happens in the city of Philadelphia that utilizes the redevelopment authority, in some instances, the Office of Housing and Community Development. Uh, the reality is, is that that particular process will probably, to some degree, be replicated in this scenario. The owners of the rental properties will probably be some of the usual suspects, but because it's happening at such an accelerated pace, it would be our thought that there will be new players in the development mix that will be in a position to develop that. So we have a significant number of developers, um, actually represented by BIA, represent a number of the developers. We obviously have the building trades on board 100%. So we look at those same individuals being the ones that would actually develop and own, ultimately own in the case of the rental developments that would include uh, nonprofits and for-profit developments. And the uh, home ownership initiative would actually uh, be done uh, by some entity in the city because all of these are public prop, publicly owned properties. Uh, one, one of the things that I want to say when you look at it, we don't really have a significant number of maps. One of the things that we've heard, particularly as we got into this whole ABI issue, you've heard this gentrification word uh, thrown around quite significantly during the ABI um, um, public hearings. And one of the things that we wanted to make sure that when we looked at opportunity zones, they, you will see represented a number of these neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are on the cusp, meaning that uh, if there's not some action by the city of Philadelphia to con ensure continual affordability, there will not be a balanced approach as it relates to the development of those neighborhoods. Uh, I don't want to have to say the usual suspects, but you can see the council members standing here, and you can pretty much get a sense of where those, where those neighborhoods are. Uh, uh, so when, when that conversation comes down about um, the areas that are turning and they only see housing being built for individuals um, that make much more than the current median income, we want to address that issue and we want to be in a position to have a balanced approach to this development. We support, because as I said, I represent Center City, Fishtown, and all the other uh, very lucrative development uh, related areas, but also represent uh, some of those people in those same neighborhoods who can't afford to buy the current product that's being produced in those neighborhoods as are the other members. So what we want to do in these neighborhoods is have a balanced approach. What you will see very quickly in the aftermath of this particular strategy, and probably concurrent to it, you will see a significant number of market rate investment. Um, it's quite clear. When you look in areas like Francisville, and I'll speak to that because I represent Francisville, we, we spent, we did 300 units of affordable housing in Francisville. Right now, on 20th Street in Francisville, a property that was purchased on the PHA auction, that property sold for $750,000, right? And that's because we made the initial investment, and now, fortunately, we're in a position to give gentrification legislation to those existing homeowners to make sure that they stay in the neighborhood. But it shows with the, with the investment, working with the, all parts of the government, state, federal, and local, that we're in a position to rebuild these neighborhoods one by one. So I believe that not only will this stimulate and uh, significantly enhance our development opportunity across the city, I think it will do it at a much very, very aggressive pace. Yeah, we actually think the land bank uh, will play a, a key role in this. If you look on the maps, in the pink, those are actually vacant tax delinquent properties. So it's our anticipation that once the land bank is up and operating, that we will be in a position to quickly move forward and acquire those properties and use them as a part of the development strategy 
to coincide with the publicly owned investment. So the land bank will be a key, play a key role in this particular product. Um, ultimately, once it's up and running, we would like to consolidate all of those properties in one place so when the developer comes in and the city department works on putting out the request for proposals, we'll be in a position to have a one-stop shop. Just as a, one point, in a neighborhood where there isn't a lot of market uh, turnover based on a brewery town or some other place like that, 150 units, if you divide it by 10, is significant. On Market Street alone, we have one or two vacant properties on a block. 150 units stabilizes a large area of my underserved community. So we haven't seen 150 units developed in that part of town in quite some time. So this is very significant for us. And in addition, puts all of those properties back on the tax roll. And we're looking for money for schools and other places. This is the way to do it. Uh -huh. All right, this is the time when I turn it back over to Herb Wetzel. Uh, I mean, it sounds like it's much more difficult than what the city is trying to do. Um, but yeah, it seems, I mean, it's like it's always been to you. Why hasn't the city done it it's before? It's a no-brainer, but there are a couple things that need to be done. Uh, yeah, well, this combination of using, <coughs> excuse me, housing authority operating subsidies and an additional operating subsidy coming from the bond issue that the city would do, has, has putting that together with the 4% credit is something not, we didn't think of it immediately. I don't know if anybody else has thought of it, but we kept hammering away at how can we use this 4% credit? How could we use this 4% credit that we're leaving on the table? And when we, as we further researched and understood how the operating subsidies from PHA work, we continued to hammer it out and then we realized there just wasn't enough of that operating subsidy, so we needed a little bit more to make it work. And that's why we need to issue the $100 million in bonds and put 100000 in a trust account and pay that operating subsidy out over 30 years. Under that scenario, it works. You can describe the 4% tax credit as a federal subsidy, if you want, and the tax-exempt bond financing are both federal sources allocated to the state of Pennsylvania. Can I, can I also respond, um, as a developer, I mean, we, we long for the public sector to get its act together and to allow us to do these kind of things. So we, we would fundamentally see this as a great opportunity. Um, we've done some 4% deals uh, as well. So uh, we look at this as a great opportunity because, again, public sector is aligned with its resources. And also the focus is so important and so, and so, so uh, a scale, it gives us an opportunity to pull all those resources, and even some resources are not even mentioned. But clearly, you guys starting a process like this uh, is just absolutely amazing. The developers will follow. Is the Housing Authority on board for this? Yeah, we've been actually working with all entities. We've been working with the PHFA in the formulation of this plan. We've been talking to the Housing Authority with the formulation of this plan. The Housing Authority has actually, on a smaller scale, initiated um, the availability of these ACCs uh, in the last um, request for funding from PHFA. A number of the developers actually went to and I believe received uh, commitment from the Housing Authority of these rent subsidies. So, they actually started the process, and it gave us an opportunity to utilize the 6,000 ACCs that are currently available and that are not being utilized. And I think in this program, we can be in a position to access um, a portion because actually, uh, under this proposal, we would probably only be using half of the ACCs. Uh, we'll be in a position to use those quite quickly. So yes, bottom line is they are a part of, they are a part of this process. Uh, not as of yet. They, they know it now. Now, we actually, I, I, I talked to the mayor briefly about the concept uh, a little while ago, but they're not aware of the details. One of the things that I've learned um, in rolling out initiatives 
when we as council put things together, we have to keep it relatively close to the vest um, until we make sure that it makes some sense. And then now we believe that this makes all the sense in the world. Um, it's clear that the borrowing uh, for this particular program uh, will actually have to be initiated by the administration. Uh, but given the fact that we've identified uh, debt service payments, from our perspective, it's a no-brainer. This is something that everybody should be. And the mayor, when I, I just briefly talked to him last week, he says he likes, I explained to him that we have a big proposal to talk about residential development. Uh, he, he said, no, we don't fear. If I respond to that question, I will take your words and put them in my mouth as to what I will do. Uh, we believe that when we sit down and talk to and work with the administration, all of us, because this is just not about council, obviously when you see nonprofits and for-profit building trades here, all the members of council, it's clear that this is an initiative that a broad range of people support, and we believe that the administration will be supportive of this initiative. The original request uh, from us to our staff was how can we build, start out a thousand units of housing in two years and they quickly put together a scenario talking to all of the uh, entities that were referenced earlier. Uh, we quickly understood that we needed to have a balanced approach that would include additional 500 home ownership initiatives. So from my perspective, two years, uh, the reality is, as one of our development friends who's actually in the business of doing it, probably said more like three or four, I'm not sure, but we want to make sure that the available dollars are quickly accessed both on the state and federal level, and we want to be in a position to move this quickly as possible, because I think the only way that this works is if you have an accelerated development pace and you want to take advantage of the strong housing market in the city of Philadelphia as it relates to certain neighborhoods and to piggyback on that and stimulate development in other uh, outlying neighborhoods across the city. That's it. The city of Philadelphia is actually first. <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned that. In the research for this particular proposal, leading up to that, so we actually looked across the, the country and we saw in all these different locations where these municipalities, municipalities that you wouldn't think they were uh, equated with affordable housing, uh, we actually found that this is a problem all over the country. Um, and we did not see a model that reflected this particular model on a broad scale. And I want to commend our staff uh, and members, uh, staff of the, all of the council members up here because they all worked on this process. I want to commend them for the good work. Uh, they came up with what I believe to be a very, very great idea. If you don't take one thing back with you, that each year we leave money on the table from the federal government that could be used for affordable housing. Each year. For the first time, we're talking about how to actually utilize that money in a meaningful way. And I think if nothing else, we're talking about about a seven, what, what, what is it we leave on the table every year? Or, the state. Yeah. On the table. And it's like, you know, why, why would you not put that money into the local economy, put that money into the pool of affordable housing? It just, it's just sad to think that we haven't done it before. Yeah, I just want to say for the record, um, I commend you for your leadership specifically on this particular issue. Um, born and raised in Point Breeze, and as I watch the neighborhood change, I'm a strong advocate to make sure that we have uh, mixed income housing specifically focusing on a level of affordable and workforce housing as well. On um, the private market, we'll make sure that we have market rate housing. I've done several different market rate uh, projects, but specifically on the issue of public land and making sure there's a level of inclusivity and in every neighborhood, um, not only in the second councilmatic district, but also in the city of Philadelphia, as Council President um, Clark had mentioned to me in private conversations, every neighborhood should be a neighborhood of choice. So whether you're low income, middle income, or high income, you should have the opportunity to live in any neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. So I applaud you 
for stepping up to the plate and addressing this issue, Council President. Thank you, Councilman. One hundred million. At this point, we are looking at the a portion of the uh, housing trust fund, which is money that's generated by the recording fees from the recording uh, of deeds. Uh, currently, that money is around eleven, twelve million dollars annually. We're looking at possibly five million of that to go towards funding the debt service on this particular initiative. Uh, that money is targeted solely for purposes of development. So we're talking about it aggressively accelerating um, the development of that money. Um, if through the course of the conversation we identify other sources to pay the debt service on this particular bond, we will obviously be in a position to do that. Um, personally, I wish it was a $300 million bond, right? I just think that the need to do something on a very aggressive scale uh, is there. Uh, for obvious reasons, but at the end of the day, you borrow the money, you have to figure out a way to pay it back. So during the course of the conversation, we hope that we're in a position to actually expand on this $1,500 1500 property initiative. Yes, sir. One of the speakers uh, mentioned two things before I was wondering if we expand upon. Um, said there was a documented need for affordable housing. I was wondering if we you know, talk about that a little bit more, about what is the need and, and how is it documented, and also the government Yeah, there, there are actually some documents um, in the book. I keep referring to that. But Herb, you can, there are a couple of instances you, yeah, yeah give. Uh, There's a study done by OHCD um, uh, dealing with the accessibility to affordable housing that was done in 2011. And there's a current, and we can probably get a link to, to folks, there's a current study, this is the fifth one in a row called Out of Reach 2013. So let me give you an example. Um, right now there are 70,000 renter households in Philadelphia that pay more than 50% of the household income for rent. The, the maximum that HUD recommends is 30%. So you've got 70,000 renter households now that are paying at least 50% of their income for rent. To give an example, Out of Reach 2013 indicates that in the city of Philadelphia, to afford a, the median price of a two-bedroom apartment, if you were on a minimum wage, you'd have to work 120 hours a week in order to only pay 30% of your income for your rent. Or in the alternative, you would have to make $21.75 an hour and then only have to work 40 hours because that would pay for your rent at 30% of your income. The, the data is just rich, and it's not just rich here in Philadelphia, and it's not rich. The, the issue of affordable housing isn't San Francisco and, and uh, New York, like the council president said. Carlsbad, New Mexico, Fort Collins, Colorado, just Google the topic, affordable housing crisis in America. It's everywhere. So we just completed a 50-unit development. Every development we've done, 50 units, we have 500, 600 applicants without fail. Is it fair to say this is targeted at the gentrifying neighborhoods and the population that is there and not the poorest of the poor neighborhoods where there is as much turnover? Well, if you look at the opportunity zones, um, a number of those zones are areas where there is the perception or in some cases the reality that gentrification is upon them. And we thought it was very important to move very aggressively in those neighborhoods because if we don't, there will be no opportunity to continue to have affordability in those neighborhoods. I mean, it's just a simple reality. So while I'm very supportive, if you know my district and what I represent of market rate housing, I also think that there should be a very aggressive approach to ensure that, as Councilman Kenyatta Johnson says, that people have an opportunity to live in every section of the city of Philadelphia. Um, so one thing that this does do, um, uh, it will free up significant dollars from the traditional community development block grant that was referenced earlier uh, that continues to, to shrink. And I think we're down to 50 million a year or under, under 40 something, 40 something million a year. Uh, it will free that money up to build in those areas uh, where there is no opportunity to do close to market rate housing 
and those areas are actually the areas that have the most challenges. So this actually expands on our opportunity uh, to build affordable housing in the city of Philadelphia and do it quite aggressively. Um, we actually think, uh, to get back to the, some of the funding scenarios, the more aggressive that we implement this program, there will actually be more money available in the aftermath to continue to support people across the city of Philadelphia. As an example, if this is a, a very aggressive and productive proposal, particularly as it relates to the home ownership side, we'll quickly see the numbers associated with the trust fund go up dramatically because there'll be a significant number of deeds recorded on property that is currently owned by the city of Philadelphia, uh, the redevelopment authority or the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Those units can now become home, home ownership units. So you'll see an aggressive uh, level of uh, infusion of cash in those, those current programs. You mentioned that you wanted to, you would rather see a $300 million bond issue or a higher bond issue. Um, why did you go with a lower number at this time? Because we can't, we can't figure out a way to pay for it. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I, just, I, mean, what, what's the there, I mean, how many, cur the current number of affordable housing is a number that I don't know, because we've, we've been doing affordable housing over a period of years. But our production has gone down dramatically. So off the top of my head, I said best case, we're probably doing actual ribbon cuttings and actual properties coming online. We're probably not doing more than 100 properties a year. That, this, you know, and over the last couple of years, because of some of the challenges that we had with the housing authority, um, we were not in a position to have produce significant numbers under that scenario either. So uh, the challenge is, you know, we continue to have diminishing funds coming uh, from the traditional sources, and we can either allow the units to diminish or we can come up with a broad and aggressive strategy to expand, as uh, Mr. Doherty said, the pot. And I think this is something that's going to work it's going to benefit everybody in the long run, uh, particularly the taxpayers of the city of Philadelphia. Thank you, Council President. And you know, what you see here is, is a vision, right? thinking outside the box. You know, no, no other major city in the, in, the, in the country is taking these bold steps in creating job opportunities, creating affordable housing, and, and, and creating residual development. You can't underscore the type of residual development that creates neighborhoods. You know, as John Doherty had stated earlier, it's like the Noah's Ark theory, right? You build a Neckert, you're going to have to build a Rite Aid. You build uh, one gas station, you're going to have to build another. You build one store, there's going to be a competing store. So this is what is, is going to make our, our communities thrive again and make it affordable for every Philadelphian. So, you know, this is a, a great vision. And this is what, this is why we have true leaders. This is why Council President is taking a leadership role and me, as uh, chairman of public property, which used to be his, you know, this is, this is why, you know, we are all in favor of thinking outside the box and creating many, many opportunities for affordable uh, housing, for you know, developing our neighborhoods, creating construction jobs and putting people back to work, and also expanding our tax base. This is great. This is going to be a signatory model throughout the country. It's happening right here today. This is the vision, and it starts right now. So, Council President, I thank you, and I thank all the stakeholders. If you're not a stakeholder that isn't in this room, you will be in this room because we're going to be having public hearings, and we welcome you because together this is going to happen, and it's going to take off. So, Council President, thank you. Thank you, sir. As Chair of the Public Property, we look forward to your great leadership on uh, actually moving these properties out of the city inventory and getting them back on the tax roll. Um, we have to work with the, the administration. You know, I mean, City Council, while we come up with a lot of great initiatives and ideas, at the end of the day, it's a partnership. So what we want to do is make sure we're all on the same page as it relates to the concept, and it will have to be two bills. One, a bill that I've actually kind of already introduced, called Development Districts, but we'll probably reintroduce it to talk about 
uh, call them opportunity zones on the home ownership portion, and the other as it relates to the borrowing uh, for the bond initiative for the rental properties uh, that will be uh, part of the uh, interaction between the administration and city council and the other stakeholders. And just to be clear, this is all, everything you're envisioning here will be built on city owned vacant current vacant land, right? No, actually not. We, we fully anticipate that, that will obviously be the early portion of the development because we do have site control, which is the primary uh, need for any development. But we genuinely believe with the land bank up and fully implemented and operating that we'll be able to quickly move vacant tax delinquent properties into the inventory uh, that will allow us to then supplement the city-owned properties in these neighborhoods. As you see, that's one of the reasons why we chose these zones because the proximity and the tax delinquent and the publicly owned land is, is, is pretty much, uh, in some cases, actually contiguous. So that, that allows for a significantly developable proposal. Does this specifically involve rehabbing existing vacant properties, or is it going to involve completely new construction? It'll be both, short answer, yes. But actually, one of the things that we found, um, not the PHA, but when the property is owned by the city of Philadelphia, and the redevelopment authority, a significant number of those properties are actually vacant because they've been vacant so long. They're actually a vacant lots because they've been vacant so long that the properties have been torn down. So the majority of them, there's a lot of, of standing housing authority stock. So they will lend themselves a possibly possible renovation. If you did say uh, you envision some city agency would have to take ownership over this, this initiative at some point and not be a J. I, I don't know. I mean, that would actually be up to um, the decision uh, by the administration and the council who would ultimately be the responsible agency. What I said is that traditionally, under these development scenarios, it's traditionally the redevelopment authority uh, because they handle all the financing for these type of initiatives, be it uh, residential or commercial. That could, in this particular case, actually be the entity that does this. But uh, at the end of the day, that would be a decision that's made by the administration and the city council. All right, folks, I want to thank you all very much, and stay tuned.